This is the final session of the conference, a panel on Beyond MDGs, a new development agenda. Now, the Millennium Development Goals, a little bit older than LIDC, not much, but they've been a repeated focus of our efforts over the first five years, and that's not surprising because at the same time, they capture the sectoral breadth of development, the need to work on many fronts, and epitomize the isolation of disciplinary approaches to development outcomes. And in 2010, a cross-college team of experts on different aspects of a Millennium Development Goal targets got together here in LIDC with the Lancet to produce an influential commission evaluating the MDGs and establishing five principles for the development post-2015. And as that 2015 deadline approaches, we thought it would be particularly interesting to reassemble that kind of expertise from across our colleges for an update and a look forward. Now, our Lancet Commission, which I noticed still has copies available, we printed a lot, um, and it's still quite current, I think. Uh, they are available outside. It built its principles for goal setting on a critique of success to date. I'm not going to summarize them here, but I'm going to mention a few because I think they'll probably come up. There were three areas of future goal setting uh, uh, that, that I particularly want to stress. The first was the observation we made across our sectors that there was, there was a great isolation of development goal setting between different sectors. The interaction between goals and the values of linking sectoral objectives had been, had been missed and there was a need for some silo busting. Uh, secondly, there was a problem with equity across the goals, a failure of the MDG process to be truly pro-poor in many instances. And finally, there was a problem of participation, the need to build goals so they apply to all rich and poor, and so that they're truly owned by communities and governments. So here we are. We're in the final stretches of the MDGs. There's a lot of discussion about what comes next. There's an intensity of international meetings and plannings of timetables. Last week in New York, David Cameron, and his co-panelists on Banky Moon's high-level panel in the MDGs revealed that they had a new set of goals they hadn't quite agreed what they were, we're going to know by the end of the month. Um, they have something big to do with removing extreme poverty. And earlier this month, the panel considering development of sustainable development goals, which followed the Rio Plus 20 Year Summit, they issued a, um, a call for, for inputs to their 10 goals. Uh, that call closed yesterday, so I hope you got them in if you had some views. Um, those goals are, are include the MDGs, interestingly rewritten in many forms, but then introduce new ideas for new kinds of goals, particularly around the environment, about keeping within planetary boundaries, about sustainability. Um, we understand there is a dialogue between the MDG and the SDG process. We don't know what it is, but uh, it's all going to come together, we're promised. And we know that parallel to this very top-down um, uh, process, there is an enormous civil society effort around future goal setting, aimed particularly at Southern voices and hearing them, and particularly at issues like equity. Beyond 2015, other um, NGOs that our colleges have worked with are, are, are very, very active in that regard. So this is a great time to assemble our MDG and our SDG thinkers across our sectors here in the Bloomsbury College to ask, how is your sector developing? What has happened since 2010 in terms of how your particular sector is looking at future goal setting? Is it coming together or is it falling apart? You know, are we, are we crossing, are we busting our silos or are we just adding more bricks to them? So let me introduce the panel to explore these questions. I'm not going to do biographies because time is short. I'm just going to introduce people and their links to this goal setting exercise. Andy Haynes from the London School of Hygiene Tropical Medicine. Um, it's going to be representing health goals here. Uh, they've been a dominant component of the MDGs. Uh, will they be so in future? Andy's deeply involved in links between health and environment, as we've heard earlier. It's also been very much involved in, in, in the sustainable development goal discussions uh, around that, that sustainable development solutions network that Jeff Sachs has been running in that area. Angela Little from the Institute of Education was a member of the original LIDC Lancet team, contributing particularly in MDG2, Universal Primary Education, but across the goals. And she's recently been involved in how the education community is rethinking um, what education might mean in future goal setting. Elaine Unterhalter, also from, sorry, I'm not I'm going according to my list, not according to people, forgive me. Uh, I'll come back. <laughs> um, is um, also from our original LIDC Lancet team. 
where she contributed particularly in gender and has subsequently been involved in follow-up uh, with Andrew Dorwood uh, preparing a presentation for the International Development Committee and their autumn uh, consideration of the future of the MDGs and has recently been working with uh, another intersectoral initiative looking at the future of goal setting. Um, Colin Poulton from SOAS was a member of our original Lancet team as well, contributing an MDG1 in poverty reduction and hunger. He's an agricultural economist. Agriculture was perhaps the, the missing word in the MDGs. Uh, has it come back? Is it, is it uh, going to be part of the future? Finally, I'm very pleased to welcome Hugh Waddington, from the International Initiative on Impact Evaluation, or 3IE. 3IE is a very special LIDC partner. We host their London offices at Gordon Square and have developed with them some, some really exciting um, initiatives, particularly our sem seminar program and what works in development, which I'm sure many of you know about. Hugh's an expert in impact evaluation and the systematic search for evidence in development. Um, some have said that the greatest achievement of the MDGs was to create a culture of measurement and evaluation in international development. Is that true? Will it be a feature of future MDGs? So here's what we're going to do. I'll start by asking each panelist to give us an overview of how their particular development area has been moving since 2010, um, and then to reflect on how that relates to some of the issues that came up in our 2010 uh, commission. Um, then after we've done that, for each speaking for about three to five minutes, we'll do a bit of um, uh, cross comments across the panel if people have thoughts or if things begin to emerge. Then we'll open it to the, to the audience for comments and questions. And we'll roll that on to about five o'clock when we'll all uh, wrap up and go have a drink. So let me begin. Um, I'll start um, perhaps at the far end. You? You've made a profession of evaluating international development. The MDGs have tried to be clear about measurable targets. Um, how does it look from your perspective? Okay, well, thank you. Uh, thanks for having inviting 3IE to be on this panel, or rather accepting our proposal that you should allow us to be on the panel. Um, <laughs> um, so we're, the bit that, we're gonna, that I'm going to cover is, is the bit that, although you did cover it in your Lancet Commission report, um, probably... Um, um, there wasn't a, as far as I know, there wasn't a specialist on your panel that kind of dealt explicitly with that area. So I'm going to try and, um, w what I would definitely say from, from when I read the, the report, um, um, that the, the general issues around the MDG8 area, um, the global partnership kind of stuff, um, you know, it, it, it certainly wasn't very specific nor time bound around what the global haves should be doing in the global partnership. So um, um, what I wanted to do um, in the time I have is, is basically, I, I think, just a tiny bit of history. So um, um, like the re there's a reason why the Millennium Development Goals were so successful. Um, part, of the, part of that was because the goals and the targets and the, um, the agenda setting was the culmination of 20 or 30 years of international conferences. So there was a huge amount of global ownership, not just in the north, but also in the south. So you have the Jomteen, the Alma Ata, all these um, uh, Beijing women's conference and, and things like this. Um, uh, secondly, um, um, the, 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 uh, the focus was, was specifically part of the results-based agenda. So, so specifically, um, we set targets for actually things that we wanted to achieve rather than things that we were going to do. And that was, that was a kind of, uh, came out of good results-based management theory and is now definitely something <coughs> which has, th this kind of culture, as you put it, of measurement has definitely now pervades most international agencies, most uh, uh, developing country governments. Um, um, but I, I would say that from the culture of evaluation perspective, which is the next shift which is going on, so we've had a, a move to measuring from measuring inputs to measuring outputs. Um, from a culture of evaluation perspective, we need to move a, a, again further on. And by which I mean, uh, what we try to do in evaluation is say what difference did our development programs, policies, um, uh, and projects make to the people that, uh, that received them. Um, did they have positive effects? Did they have negative effects? Um, um, so, um, the, the kind of, um, um, 
there's, there's now a new context in which the future MDGs are, are going to be working. One of them is that there is now uh, more acceptance of evaluation culture, although, although it should probably go further. Um, the second one is that we have this kind of changing geopolitical context, which is that uh, as Andy Sumner's work around 75% of the global poor being based in middle income countries, incidentally places where, which are no longer eligible for concessional aid, and so what can the, uh, what can the rich countries do to, to uh, which kind of suggests a, a move away from just providing money to providing te technical, more, more information type of, 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 um, of, of resources. Um, um, thirdly, um, uh, thirdly, the shift towards the new targets um, are going to be much more relating to quality rather than quantity of development. So the obvious cases in education, um, universal primary education, fine, we, we may not reach it at the global level, but increasingly in a large number of countries which have achieved it, it's now about improving test scores. And so these are, these are all areas where... Um, um, uh, technical solutions um, and, and improving the, the quality and the dissemination of technical solutions to solve problems set by policy makers can, can be helpful. So um, um, uh, about 10 years ago, um, when I was studying at Sussex University, um, this book came out. Um, I don't think it was a bestseller because I've never seen anybody else with a copy of it, but, it, but it was, it's by Richard Black and Howard White and it's called Targeting Development Critical Perspectives on the Millennium Development Goals. Um, and in this book, um, Black and White argued that um, there was a key... Yes, it's good, it's good, isn't it? Um, there, there, there was a key disconnect between this, this results-based movement that we knew what... Um, we'd set these, uh, these long-term outcomes... Um, uh, and we knew what we were going to do, or we had things that we were going to do, but basically there was a missing middle, and what we'd, we'd, we'd kind of refer to that in today's language is there was a lack of theory of change between where, where we wanted to get to and what we actually had. So I'm just going to make two, um, um, two kind of areas where I think that um, future MDGs could be, could be better. The first is, is kind of solving this miss, missing middle by having um, better intermediate outcomes, this, this doesn't mean having um, targets for the types of policies that we think countries should be implemented, and that was obviously the big failure with structural adjustment programs. They, they basically set policies, a cookie-cutter approach, and you know, that clearly didn't work out. But, um, but at least you know, if, if, if our goal is to eradicate uh, global uh, extreme poverty, then we presumably we want some targets on those the hard to reach groups, so the people with disability, um, other other groups um, that basically to go the final mile we'll actually have to specific focus on these people, um, or or perhaps um, um, specific targets on intermediate outcomes like um, um, uh, staple food yields and, and and that kind of thing. Um, the, the second point is is about more of a um, um, a a um, dedication by the rich country governments to actually helping produce um, and disseminate good quality evidence. And by good quality evidence, I don't, I don't, I, you know, I don't think we should adopt a cookie cutter approach to evidence in the same way that the Washington Consensus adopted a cookie cutter approach to policy. So we, you know, we mean appropriate evidence to answer the right question for the right policy. But um, that's where I would see um, the. Um, and and they, I really do think that having some specific targets around those things for uh, the uh, rich countries would, would be important. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You alluded to education. I'll move on to Angela now. Uh, education, uh, the poster child of the MDGs, in a way, perhaps, in terms of success, but what, what is your perspective on what's going to happen? Thank you very much, Jeff. Um, and Hugh's reference to the book by Black and White reminded me of a conversation I had many years ago when I worked at the Institute of Development Studies with a, an, an agricultural economist called Stephen Biggs. And Steve Biggs and I got together and said, wouldn't it be nice to write a book co-authored by Biggs and Little? <laughs> <laughs> and then we said, OK, it would be nice to have a book co-authored by Biggs and Little, but what on earth would we write about? And we promised each other that one day we would do some research together on school farms. 
Um, and we haven't quite got round to that, but now that I'm officially retired, maybe there's still time to, to write that book. Okay, so what has happened in the education sector um, since our writing of the Lancet Commission? MDG Goal 2 uh, stated that by 2015, children everywhere, boys and girls alike, are able to complete a full course of primary schooling. Now, if you look at the statistics over the, the um, period 1999 to 2010, because um, I'm afraid that although we're in 2013, uh, in terms of, of uh, global statistics on education, the most recent that we have available are from 2010. Um, the change in the net enrolment ratio of children in primary schooling um, has been from uh, a ratio of 80% to 88% over that 10-year period. So over the 10 years, there seems to have been, roughly speaking, a 10% increase um, over those 10 years, which you might say is, is, is rather good. Over the same period, the gender parity index improved from 0 0.92 to 0 0.98. These are good news stories. Um, but when we undertook our research for the Lancet publication, it was, although it was published in 2010, um, our working group got together in 2008 and 2009, and we were again working with data that were two years out of date. And the net enrolment ratio in 2006 was already 88%. So there hasn't actually been any significant increase in the net enrolment ratio in primary education uh, since 2006. Uh, uh, and 2000 and sorry between 2006 and 2010 so if we look at this a little, little more closely um, we will indeed see that in recent years there has been a stalling of performance on MDG2 and although Jeff said that MDG2 was very much or seemed to be five years ago the poster girl um, among the MDGs I think now we have a very very different picture just let me quote you one or two of the headlines from the most recent uh, global monitoring report for education that is published by the GMR team based in UNESCO. On current trends, the target of universal primary education will be missed. The number of out-of-school children of primary school age indeed fell from 108 million in 1999 to 61 million in 2010 but still this is 61 million and if you actually add to the 61 million um, and these are children who are not officially enrolled but if we add to that uh, the number of children who are enrolled on the register but who are not attending school regularly for various reasons who are repeating <laughs> years and who are achieving very little the effective number of out of learning children is much much greater um, the rate of decline was indeed, um, uh, sorry, the rate of decline of the out-of-school children was very rapid between 1999 and 2004, but then it started to slow, and progress has stalled since 2008. Sub-Saharan Africa, where the number of children out of school increased by 1.6 million between 2008 and 2010, accounts for half of the world's total. Dropout remains a problem in low-income countries, where on average only 59% of those who start school reach the last grade of primary school. The problem is particularly acute for those children who start late. In other words, if the official entry age for primary education is five, we see in many systems large numbers of children coming in at the age of six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and we now have a considerable body of evidence which suggests that if you come in more than two years late, you never catch up. I think it's fair to say that the MDG target um, for MDG Goal 2 um, is going to be missed. Now, the second question that we were asked to address um, on this panel was how does progress in the education sector relate to some of the themes and indeed the recommendations that we made in the Lancet um, report. Towards the end of that report, we set out a set of, I think it was five principles that we hoped would frame 
uh, the discourse about the MDGs in the coming years. Three of those had to do with the principle of equity, ownership, and holism. And I'm going to just comment very briefly on each of those. I think the equity issue, and it has cropped up several times during today's discussion, um, has to do with um, distribu distribution, um, and it has to do with programs which are targeted, which are pro-poor. Um, I think that it's fair to say that what we set out uh, on equity um, chimes with, is consonant with, uh, a number of other themes in the MDG discourse. Uh, there is certainly a, in the education community a large degree of consensus over the need for the future MDG targets and indicators to embrace uh, distributional uh, measures, to embed them. Um, it's also true to say now that uh, in contrast to several years ago, the Global Monitoring Report on Education uh, now publishes every year distributional uh, statistics. Um, there is now, um, for those of you who are interested in exploring this further, there is something called the World Inequalities Database on Education. And this brings together the latest data from, from demographic and health surveys and multiple indicator cluster surveys, often known as the DHS surveys and the MIX surveys. And I think this is, this is progress because a lot of the data that we have hitherto had to rely on in education has come from ministries of education and it's come from enrolment figures from schools. It hasn't essentially come from households and communities. And the DHS surveys and the MIX surveys um, are a very good uh, complementary tool for accessing information about um, which children are in school and out of school. Let me say something uh, briefly about ownership. Uh, we said that the principle of ownership entails questions about who sets goals, how they are represented, how they're legitimated, and what relationships they have with targets. Um, and Jeff has already um, spoken about the intensity of consultations that there have been in different parts of the world about the new MDGs and indeed about possible uh, targets. And in, in education, we see exactly the same thing. Um, in March, the UN Global Thematic Consultation on Education for the post-2015 uh, goals took place in Dakar. In the same month, a Commonwealth Ministerial Working Group met. Um, there is a learning metrics force which has been co-convened by the UNESCO Unis <coughs> um, uh, Institute of Statistics and uh, Brookings Institution to discuss the possibility of a creating a learning uh, goal. Here um, in the Bloomsbury Colleges, the, the Institute of Education, um, the uh, we hosted uh, a meeting with DFID colleagues um, of the United King Kingdom Forum for International Education and Training. Today, as we speak, the European Commission is running a high-level conference on education and the post-2015 process. I think in the international spaces, there's no shortage of consultation and talk about the goals and the targets. Um, certainly many NGOs are involved in these discussions. Research institutes like our own are involved in these discussions. Advocacy groups are very active. Um, however, most of the NGO work um, I think in education, and I stand to be corrected, originates in the international NGOs based in the developed countries. I'm really not convinced, or at least let me put it this way, I don't know how much debate is going on among NGOs and CSOs which are based in developing countries. So I raise that as a, as a point of concern. And my final a comment is about the third principle that we set out, which was the principle of holism. There's been a lot of discussion today, or several references to siloism, um, and the um, tendency for all institutions, uh, including uh, our own uh, uh, institutions uh, very close to home, there's a tendency for us to work um, in, in vertical ways, uh, to work in, in disciplinary silos and indeed in sectoral silos. And we were at pains in the Lancet uh, report to point to the complementarities and the interdependencies of many of the um, uh, Millennium Development Goals. Uh, I worked through, for example, the 
the implications starting from an education uh, point of view. And I argued there that education and learning have direct um, impacts on development. They have indirect impacts through their more direct impact on other sectors like health. They, have, they enjoy reciprocal relations uh, with the other MDGs, and they enjoy synergistic uh, relations with the MDGs. And I think our concern there was that although these things happen um, almost naturally, um, are there not ways in which we could capitalise on the potential synergies between, for example, education and health at the grassroots level by looking at integrated forms of planning at a low level. And I fear that, I, I don't think that this message has really got through um, in, in the discourse because the MDG discourse, after all, is focused on goals, on targets and indicators. And I know I'm probably already uh, one or maybe two minutes over my time, but I'm just going to throw what might be a spanner in the works. I'm going to raise the question, it's a skeptical question, about who these MDGs are really for. Are they for national governments? Are they for local governments? Are they for local communities? Or are they a means to legitimate international organizations to ensure their survival and to ensure that they secure budgetary resources for the next five years. Thank you. Thank you for that. I think we'll come back to that one. Um, <laughs> Andy, on to you. You know, some say that health uh, got the lion's share of the MDGs, three specific MDGs, health targets, and six of the eight MDGs. Um, what do you think is going to happen next? Yes, well, um, I think health is quite a mixed picture, as you say. Health was very much at the center of the MDGs, 18 of the 48 indicators were related to health. And we've seen quite a mixed picture in terms of achievements. Uh, certainly, malnutrition, food insecurity has been a continuing problem. About 150 million under five children are malnourished. About 35% of deaths in young children under five are related to malnutrition. And I don't know, depending on the figures, but perhaps a, a, a approaching a billion people are living um, in food insecurity, living with, with hunger. Uh, and as we know, there have been fluctuations in food prices, but overall food prices have continued to rise for a number of reasons, including possibly climate change, but other reasons um, as well. When we look at uh, child survival, there has been progress, there's been substantial progress, fall in deaths from about 12 million uh, in 1990 to about 7.6 million in 2010. So substantial progress, but um, it's very unlikely that the MDG will be achieved, which of course was to cut child death rates by two thirds. However, um, having said that, in Africa we are seeing accelerating uh, reductions in child mortality. The thing that's staying up though is neonatal mortality, which is the um, the deaths in the first month of life. So the older children's death rates are falling, but neonatal mortality has, has remained quite high. With chronic diseases, with HIV um, and TB, we have seen again some real advances. Uh, about 6.5 million, probably rather more now, people uh, are on treatment with antiretroviral <coughs> therapy, which is really an extraordinary um, achievement. But nevertheless, far too many people are still acquiring um, HIV. Uh, and of course it will be more difficult to scale up treatment from where we are now because many of the relatively easy to reach populations have been reached. Tuberculosis is a relative success story and the deaths are, are, are probably, will probably be halved uh, by 2015. And again we've seen advances in malaria as well. Malaria deaths are thought to have um, a, a decreased by about a quarter. So substantial um, advances there, partly due to insecticide treated nets, uh, but also because of improved diagnostics um, and, and treatment uh, as well. Water and sanitation, again, certainly in urban areas, water supply has improved, but many rural populations, that's about 20%, still don't have access to improved uh, water. So it's a mixed picture. Um, maternal mortality has been a, a particular problem. Uh, maternal mortality is falling, but not as quickly as would be needed to achieve the MDG. And the reason for that is it's proved particularly stubborn is because it requires quite sophisticated health systems because you need skilled attendants at birth in order to reduce maternal uh, mortality. So 
that um, is declining at quite a slower, uh, slow pace. So quite a mixed picture, um, but as you said in your introduction, Jeff, the question now is will health fare as well um, as uh, it has uh, in the MDGs? And I think there are real concerns about that. There are 11 thematic uh, groups at the moment that are consulting on the post-2015 development agenda. Only one of these is on health. And there will only probably be one health-related uh, SDG, or Sustainable Development Goal, and that will probably be either life expectancy, or possibly healthy life expectancy, life expectancy, maximizing life expectancy at different points in the life course. So that is a kind of overarching goal, if you like, which reflects not just health care, health services, but also the social and environmental and economic determinants uh, of health. The concept that's on everyone's lips at the moment is universal health coverage. What that means is that all people um, receive the health services they need without suffering financial hardship. And that's an important um, overarching concept because we know that um, catastrophic health expenditures are a very major factor in driving families um, into, into poverty. So certainly universal health coverage has become um, a, if you like, a unifying theme in many of the discussions about the post-MDG environment. But there are problems in defining what we mean by universal health coverage. In essence, we need to extend basic health services to the uncovered population, often the poorest and most marginalised. We need to expand the scope of, of health services broader than just communicable diseases, increasingly into non-communicable diseases like heart disease, uh, mental health, cancer, which are increasing um, in low- and middle-income country populations. And we need to reduce cost-sharing uh, and fees. So one of the indicators may be, for example, catastrophic expenditure due to out-of-pocket um, payments. Um, another might be the incidence of impoverishment due to out-of-pocket payments for health. So these are the kind of issues that are currently being discussed. And because universal health coverage is a complex, um, a complex concept, there is no single measure, but it will probably be a composite of financial protection and perhaps some of the MDG indicators uh, and some of tracer conditions, uh, some of the common uh, non-communicable diseases or at least risk factors for them. But finally, I think the other area which is perhaps even more interesting to a conference like this is how health links to social and environmental sustainability. And I think the MDGs have been much less successful, particularly when we come to MDG 7 and 8, forging environmental sustainability, forging a partnership for development. And by and large, I think we've, as John Bellington showed this morning, we've not moved very much in that direction. And, we, and in many, many ways, we're worse off than we were because of the, we've breached these environmental boundaries, as we've heard this morning from uh, John Bellington. So although we may have temporary gains to health and development, the real worry is what's coming over the horizon over the next few decades. So in concluding, I would like to propose that one of the things that we should do in health is to look increasingly at those policies that will both promote environmental sustainability, that's to say promote reductions in greenhouse gas emissions or increases in resilience to environmental change and at the same time improve health. And let me close by giving you just a couple of examples of those. One of them might be in terms of energy, provision of clean energy sources. We know that many people today don't have access to clean energy, as we heard this morning. About 3.5 million deaths a year due to outdoor air pollution, and about 3.5 million deaths a year due to indoor air pollution, household air pollution, particularly women and children. And that's because when you go into many homes in poor-income countries, the first thing that strikes you are, is the incredibly high level of indoor air pollution. And that, we now know, is a, is a major killer. So developing policies that will provide clean energy to the home and to society more generally will reduce um, greenhouse gas emissions, but will also improve uh, human health uh, potentially quite dramatically. Secondly, in terms of urban transport, uh, we know that many cities are choking uh, because they're relying on private transport. And we need to move more towards public transport systems and improved, increased opportunities for walking and cycling. And again, that will reduce air pollution and also reduce sedentary lifestyles, which is a major driver of obesity 
um, and many other non-communicable diseases. And finally, in moving towards a more sustainable food and agriculture system, we need indicators that reflect both malnutrition, like stunting, for example, but also um, the, in a sense, overnutrition leading to obesity, which is becoming a driving force for diabetes and chronic disease um, in many countries. So these are the kind of policies that we need to be looking at, policies that will both enhance environmental sustainability and improve health. Thank you very much. Thank you, indeed. So, Elaine, on to gender. Uh, gender got into the MDGs, but not very much, I think we'd all agree, not, as, not nearly as much as one would have hoped. Um, is it going to be a bigger feature in the next incarnation? Um, thanks, Jeff. Well, I, I think the thing about uh, the women's rights movements and people concerned with gender is they, they've always felt very um, restive about being in the MDGs. They both like being in the MDGs, but are extremely critical of the framework. And um, in terms of assessing what's happened from 2010 um, to now, um, that kind of, are we, are we friends or are we not friends with the MDGs? Do we really want to be in the club or do we want to be out of what them? Is, is, a, is a really key theme amongst women's rights and, and gender activists. I think what's happened uh, since 2010 is that uh, the MDG3 constituency has kind of felt quite confident to escape from the MDG framework. And a number of things, I think, have, have helped boost this, this confidence. The first is um, the emergence of uh, violence against women and gender-based violence is an absolutely massive global issue. You, um, uh, I can't pinpoint what exactly made it start to happen, whether it was the appalling level of rape in um, the east of DRC that started to get international uh, attention, whether it was events like um, the shooting of Malala in Pakistan, um, the uh, horrific um, uh, rape in, uh, and murder in, in Delhi over Christmas. But the issue about violence against women has risen and risen and risen. And at the um, CSW, the Committee on the Status of Women conference in um, New York in March, at last passed a resolution on violence against women. So. The fact that it had always been a critique of the women's rights organizations that there was nothing in the MTG framework that was about violence against women. And I think it's rising and rising up the global agenda. And maybe, however difficult it is to measure, it's, it's registering as a matter of concern. The second issue that um, I think has been evident since 2010 is the issue about the problematic measure in MDG3 about women's employment. One of the indicators is about women's employment in the formal sector. And one of the uh, puzzles and difficulties that's been apparent around um, the effects of austerity, economic austerity and the effects of the global financial crisis is there are a lot more women in employment, but what kind of employment they're in are very, very poor quality jobs. And so the kinds of issues that the women's rights organizations always ro raised about the problem with the MDG indicator that if you measured women in the formal sector, 90% uh, of women didn't work in the formal sector. What this has also risen, ra risen sorry, um, pushed up the agenda is the fact that there was no MDG target about jobs or employment. Although I was very interested to see that on David Cameron's leaked, or whether they were leaked or not, 10 goals last week in uh, New York, um, labor is one of them, jobs is one of them, boost jobs was one of them. So what kind of jobs, whether they're decent jobs or not, but that's something that's happened since two, 2010. A third thing that's happened since 2010 is this question about who speaks on gender and women's, uh, women's issues um, has multiplied and gone uh, into so many different directions. It was, I mean, the women's movement has always been a very complex, many-headed, many, um, very plural 
uh, kind of organization. And the fact that you've got women in high profile positions, so the number of world leaders has, uh, who are women, I think, has gone up from one to six, which is nothing compared to you know, that large um, range of gray suits at the, always taken at the UN General Assembly. But the, the fact that you've got UN women um, as, as a pretty articulate um, but much contested spokesperson um, keeps the issue on the boil. So the um, diverse voices have been raised in many, many places. Um, and the, the, the debate is really between whether goals, targets, and indicators, the kinds of framework um, I think all the three previous speakers have spoken with enthusiasm about, where, is, it, is that good for women? Or is, does it actually undermine a concern with issues, policies, processes, and people? And that's, the, the debate is very live between those who say, let's make better goals and indicators, or that's an impossible task. And I sit very much between those two positions. I find it hard to come down on them. And the last area that's erupted since 2010 is the issue around the equity goal, because gender was, it could be argued, the only equity goal in the MDG framework. But now a very articulate equity demand has emerged. There are better indicators of equity. Angela's outlined some of the better indicators of education equity. There are better indicators of um, income equity than uh, the Gini coefficient being put forward. And is gender going to lose out? If we get an equity goal, will we lose a gender goal? That's, so the, the, those are one of the debates. It, it, will there be a standalone gender? How does this link with the work we did on The Lancet? Well, I think a number of these themes were foreshadowed in what we spoke about in The Lancet. The problem of ownership, the problem of who speaks for gender, we raised in The Lancet and in our principles. The lack of holism, um, which we raised in The Lancet issue, um, emerges in talking about the gender, uh, gender issues in a particular range of ways. And if those of you with, who were here before T and heard Jenny Parks talk about different ways of thinking about gender as a, as a frontier of interdisciplinary knowledge, I think raises it uh, very, um, in a very generative way. Because gender emerges in the MDG framework in a very reductive way, just as gender parity, equal numbers of men and women. But it doesn't um, grow into um, the more structural ideas about inequality that has been part of the concerns of the women's movements. And in fact, the goals and targets have had perverse effects. So the stress on gender parity in education and the um, MDG2, which has the stress on universal primary education, had the perverse effects that Andy was uh, pointing out, that you didn't get any investment or very limited investment in teacher education or the training of the skilled birth attendants to um, push forward the delivery of the MDG. So the lack of attention to gender at many different levels of education and the forms of gender inequalities that are not just about numbers uh, was an imp a difficult and perverse effect. Um, in terms of looking forward, the work Jeff alluded to that I did with Andrew Dorwood, um, uh, building on the Lancet Commission, and which has just been published in Social Indicators Research, talks about this problem of uh, the missing middle, and we didn't know that phrase, I think, came from the black and white book, but that the problem with the MDGs is that they conceive of the uh, problem as a bottom-up problem and a top-down problem. Um, but that what is missing is this intersection and the circulation of ideas between professionals, so there's no framework around training professionals, between 
kinds of knowledge, the sort of debate we were having between around tea, between um, governments, NGOs. It's um, so the, there's a lack of attention to how um, people talk from bottom up, top down, and then across sectors. And I think that maybe talks to the lack of connective disciplines that we didn't consider enough in the Lancet um, Commission. I don't think there was possibly enough attention to these disciplines like sociology, history, and politics. And I think that, that a, a lot of the debate about where the MDGs are, will go has been very richly driven by um, contestations over the politics of development, not just the content, but the politics and who decides. And I think the looking beyond 2015, um, the debate for the gender community, I think, and the, the big ask is to have both a, a dedicated gender goal and a gender component of every goal, but that the women's rights and gender equality constituency doesn't get limited and squashed into the MDG basket. It doesn't get constrained, a lack of funds because it doesn't meet the MDG, it doesn't sing on the MDG hymn sheet, but that it's much wider resourced and supported um, politically, financially, socially, and um, culturally. Thanks. Thank you. Hello. Um, last to MDG one, um, where perhaps agriculture was perhaps a bit of a bit hidden in that. But one of the most dramatic things that's happened over the last ten years has been the food price crisis. Uh, agriculture is left to the front of the agenda. Will it be part of the agenda in the next round of development goals? <laughs> uh, actually, um, thanks, Jeff. I'm not sure that I've got an answer as to whether it will be. I'll make a case that, it, there's a, that perhaps it should be um, in a second. Um, possibly I represent slightly less of an inside track on some of the, uh, what's happening on, on the goals here than my, my fellow panel members. Um, very quickly, in terms of MDG 1, um, it has three uh, main targets. Um, the halving of extreme poverty, um, having a hunger target um, and a target which came later and is largely overlooked on achieving full and productive employment and decent work for all and the, the general view seems to be that there hasn't been much progress on that one um, Andy's already talked about uh, the hunger target I'll come back to it in a second um, the extreme poverty target uh, with the main indicator focusing on uh, the proportion of people living on less than $1.25 a day. Um, it's now believed that that target was actually achieved at global level sometime in 2010, um, although the question of statistics which uh, Angela's mentioned, so even the the latest MDG tracking report, which is dated 2012, still says we think that was the case, but we, uh, we're still waiting for confirmation. Um, and actually, an uh, interesting reflection on data, although lots of the data collection efforts made to monitor the MDGs, um, on both uh, the $1.25 a day uh, indicator uh, and on the FAO indicator of uh, those who are undernourished, the 2012 report is still using 2008 data, so we are still you know, a little way behind in our, our data collection. Anyway, it's believed that um, globally the $1.25 uh, a day uh, target um, was hit five years early, um, but so much of that progress is a result of what's happened particularly in China, um, but in uh, East and Southeast Asia more generally. Uh, South Asia and particularly Sub-Saharan Africa uh, lag some way behind on the target there. Uh, that said, um, there, it, by 2008, the absolute numbers of people living on less than $1.25 a day uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa was believed to have peaked 
um, and actually the absolute numbers are starting to fall and there has been quite a lot of uh, excitement, I guess, uh, in the last few years that uh, Sub-Saharan Africa is actually starting to see a period of fairly sustained growth, which had a small knock in 2008-9, but seems to be coming back again. Uh, that said, um, I would say that the big issue coming out on MDG1, uh, which has been alluded to a little bit already, and I, I imagine is going to get featured uh, in the uh, goals and targets to come, is very much the inequality issue. Um, Hugh mentioned the work by Andy Sumner uh, at IDS, uh, estimating that three quarters of those living under $1.25 a day are uh, in middle-income countries. So the bottom billion hypothesis of uh, Paul Collier that actually our real challenge in tackling extreme poverty is to try and get growth going in a defined number of countries where there just hasn't been a growth process um, is really quite seriously challenged by that. These middle-income countries, many of them have actually had to grow quite fast to get to middle-income because they weren't middle-income countries by 1990 or even 2000. Many of them are continuing to grow for quite fast, but the benefits are not in any way equal. Um, so that takes us very much, the inequality takes us into the politics of what's going on there. In the African countries as well, whilst there has been sustained growth in many countries in the continent in the last five to ten years, actually a, a lot of it, it's not entirely a minerals phenomenon, but the, uh, the minerals boom in Africa has been an important component of that. And the distribution of benefits from minerals-led growth in, in an economy is very narrow. And so we are getting quite considerable increases in inequality, even in the very poorest countries, which are now growing rapidly. So I think a focus on inequality needs to be a big part of the agenda. Um, I could imagine it being, at, in many of the areas that we're looking at, at certainly at indicator level, one of the key indicators across all the goals that come post-2015, being something about distribution or inequality, and if that's not already on the agenda, I think it really ought to be for all of them. Um, if you take um, the hunger uh, target, there are two key indicators there, and there have been big problems with data on, on one of them, which is a, an FAO one on undernourishment, and the figures had to be revised quite seriously. Uh, recently, they, they projected a big increase in the number of undernourished in the world as a result of food price rises and then had to revise those estimates down. If you take the other one, uh, the uh, proportion of children under five who are, who are underweight, um, interestingly in the latest um, MDG monitoring report, the data is presented for each region, averages for the region, it's then presented by gender within each region, there's not a lot of difference by gender. It's presented urban-rural, and in general the rates of uh, underweight are about 50% higher in rural areas than in urban areas, and it's then presented as a comparison of the uh, poorest wealth quintile against the um, least poor wealth quintile, uh, and the rates of underweight are about three times as high in almost all regions in the highest wealth quintile compared to the, the poorest wealth quintile. So suggesting that inequality is a big, a big issue there. But then, as Andy's already said, that's only part of the story because the other part of the story is in many of these same countries, whilst we've still got a problem of uh, undernutrition at one end, we're getting growing um, overnutrition and obesity problems at, at the other end. And this seems to me a very uh, interesting area, not only for uh, the number of disciplines that have uh, insights into this as a problem, but also how the um, Millennium Development Goals post-2015 relate to the Sustainable Development Goals, because it seems to me that the MDGs post-2015 will probably still focus on the undernutrition areas, whereas the obesity issue and the overnutrition is very much a sustainable 
development issue in terms of the energy that's going into overfeeding the, uh, all these people who are getting less healthy as a result. Um, Jeff asked about agriculture. Um, had my colleague Andrew Dorwood been in the country today, he would have been here instead of me. So let me just flag something that uh, Andrew has been working on. Um, Hugh talked about the missing middle and talked about the critical role of staple food yields um, as, a, as an important development indicator. Andrew uh, has a paper in food policy that's come out this year arguing the case uh, for the critical role of food prices and particularly keeping food prices low through agricultural productivity increases as something that will stimulate wider development in an economy. Um, but having to achieve that nowadays without relying on increasing fossil fuel use through fertilizers to increase that uh, higher productivity and therefore proposing some indicators that sort of put those different issues together which are looking both at sustainable development um, and at the sort of missing middle of the theory of change of how you achieve poverty reduction but I think particularly how you moderate inequality in the early stages of the growth process. And the observation, um, particularly in African countries which are growing rapidly now, those that are prioritizing smallholder agriculture for political reasons are, are seeing a much more equitable growth and development path than those that are not and are seeing their growth driven largely by minerals. So that would be a very good intermediate indicator which would hit a whole range of different goals if it was uh, in there. Great. Thank you, Carl. Yeah, I don't think there are many organizations like the Bloomsbury Colleges where you could get that kind of in-depth analysis across the whole breadth of our development goals. Thank you for that. That was excellent. And apologies for not doing seven. That was my job and I didn't do my homework. And eight, which we never tackled because we couldn't get somebody to deal with. But I think the... <laughs> yeah. Oh, you're right. Um, and I, I think we wouldn't want to miss a minute of that, but we are running up against our time barrier here. So I'm going to modify our um, plan to go around the panel and go around the audience and just open this up for about 10 minutes. One thing I do want to say, though, I want to maybe, I'll say this is like a question from the floor, ask uh, Anna to collect a few. My question from the floor is, I'm hearing that equity has really been a bit of a disaster. People know about it. It's likely to be something very much a feature of future goals. Uh, that is a measurement of, of quintiles or some kind of measure of, 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 uh, of, that would allow a pro poor approach. I'm hearing the participation, it's not been great, but, but there, you almost couldn't develop goals now that didn't have a degree of participation or most of the people who have been participating would walk away. And we heard that particularly in, in the gender context. Holism. I don't hear much happening at all in, in, in linking up these goals. And I hear a lot of stories of what's beginning not to happen as a result of that. So maybe that's sort of a question if somebody in the panel wants to pick up. But let's open it now to um, the floor as well and other panel members. Yes, please. There's a question or a comment up there. Oh, and you have your hand up too. <laughs> OK, well, I feel we, we have to uh, address the, the last question about, about food prices and it is interesting how sort of debate has has shifted a bit as we've gone from a, an era where global food prices were, were falling through the 90s into the early 2000s and then they spiked again a couple of times uh, in the past five years and some people who argued previously that low food prices were bad now arguing that actually high food prices were bad. Um, I think it's very clear that for the poorest to spend 50% plus of their income on food, that low food prices um, are a really important uh, part of, their, of the process that will help them out of poverty. What we want is for, ideally, is for those low food prices to be driven by productivity income, uh, productivity increases amongst smallholder producers so that even though they're getting a 
a price that's not that high because their productivity is, uh, is rising, that they're also benefiting a little bit. But the number of poor consumers exceeds the number of people who are surplus producers. So in the bottom, uh, the bottom end of the spectrum, I think it's fairly clear um, you know, what we would like. Um, I think there is then a, you know, a big challenge um, uh, as to what happens in contexts where there's, there's, there's large amounts of income available and low food prices may feed through into obesity. I think it's more complex than that. I'm not actually sure what the latest research uh, tells us on that, but I agree it can have different effects for different groups. Thank you. Elaine, uh, final comments. Um, just to say, uh, part of my uh, uh, ambiguity always is that if gender is everywhere, it's always nowhere. So it can be nowhere. So that it's very important if we're going to have gender in every goal, that we have it in every goal or in every target in a very precise way. And one of the issues um, that uh, the, I think the very interesting concern to focus on corruption, which was also, or governance was also on David Cameron's list, and so maybe it's edging into the um, Premier League of, of goals and targets, um, is, but gender mainstreaming isn't. And the, so where money goes and how it's spent on women and men and what the effects are, perverse or otherwise, that needs to, I think, continue to um, be in central to everyone's frame. Thank you. Andy. Uh, no, just a few comments. Uh, first of all, I mean, I, I'm very much in favour of including some measure of equity, but I just saw a headline in The, in the Guardian about uh, what Cameron said, we must target poverty, not pay. And I think what that means is that he's going to be pushing for some target around eradication of extreme poverty, but not looking overall at distributional issues, which some would argue is also important. I totally agree that holism is lacking, and I think that's why my argument would be, would be that we need to develop goals and indicators that do integrate um, a number of uh, a, a number of endpoints. So, for example, indicators that reflect sustainable development as well as improving health and perhaps education. I do think that gender is absolutely vital, and I think that can be achieved by either having gender-specific uh, indicators, but also some policies will predominantly benefit women. For example, household energy, clean energy will benefit women and children you know, predominantly. And so we must ensure that those policies are put in place. There are a few policies which might benefit men. One might be around tobacco. For example, having an indicator around tobacco would uh, benefit men, although, of course, in some countries, women's smoking is increasing. Um, finally, I would say we shouldn't um, try... I, I think that my concern is that a lot of this debate uh, is not focusing on the responsibilities of rich countries. I think it's very easy, and it's important, of course, to focus on the MDGs and the extreme poor. But the other side of the coin is that the rich countries also have very major responsibilities. And it is the lifestyle of the over-consuming countries which is driving us into this kind of environmental unsustainability. And Cameron won't want to touch that. But I think you know we should be really arguing that this is absolutely has to be central. You cannot have a pact which is just about eradicating extreme poverty. It has to be about changing the trajectory of development. And that will mean removing some subsidies. I mean, there are massive fossil fuel subsidies. There are massive, massive agricultural subsidies which are distorting the world economy. So they need to be um, uh, addressed. Thank you. Angela. Thank you. Uh, I'd also like to make a comment on the distributional point. Uh, because this article in The Guardian that was published last Wednesday said David Cameron is fighting plans to place a commitment to reducing income inequality in the developing world into a major UN report about the MDGs. Um, whether or not David Cameron gets his way about not having a distributional measure for income, which pertains to MDG 1, I don't think in any sense that should convince the rest of us not to argue for distributional measures on all the other goals. Um, he's talking about income uh, inequality, and I think we could, dis we, could, we could disagree with him about that, but there is a danger that he may get his way on that. But I think that at the same time, we should just carry on working uh, to ensure that we do get distributional measures built into the indicator framework uh, for the next round of the, of the MDGs on all the other components. I also I think... I think we, we, we need to try to influence the discussion about distribution. Um, there seems to be an assumption in the way that this um, 
UN discussion has been uh, reported, that to focus on inequality and reducing inequalities means to bring those who are at the top down. Well, I think in this country, it probably would mean that we would uh, try and put a few more curbs on what our banking community uh, colleagues are doing. Uh, but in general terms, I don't see why distribution uh, has to involve bringing the top down. Why can't we just try and move everybody up? Uh, what we're talking about is differences between <coughs> the different quintiles or the deciles, uh, but ultimately, in terms of development, we are trying to move everybody <coughs> up the educational ladder, everybody up the health ladder. And I think that sometimes we get polarities in the discussion about growth and distribution which are not very helpful. Also, another comment on equity is that in the discourse, equity for many people is um, equated with equality or identity. Equality of inputs, equality of processes, equality of outcomes. But in, if we are um, committed, as I think most of us in this room are committed to poverty eradication, equity actually means more inputs of better quality for the poorest. In education, we have talked for many years about programs of compensatory education, education inputs that actually compensate for the disadvantages that come from uh, poor home backgrounds. So I think the equity debate can be extended um, massively, but I think we just have to keep on with it. And just a final comment um, sparked by uh, the question from Kenya, um, our colleague from Kenya, uh, about quality and quantity. It's very true that uh, one of the uh, concerns among the education community um, over the last five to ten years is that the MDG2 has distracted attention away from questions of quality. Unfortunately, the way that some of the powerful bodies within that debate are responding to that is to try and develop universal measures of learning outcomes, to try and construct tests of literacy which somehow have equivalence across all countries and can be applied. Now, the mistake here, I think, is that test scores, um, are in, perhaps they are an indicator of quality, but they don't tell you how to improve those test scores. And what the discussion about goals, targets, and indicators has succeeded in doing is distracting a lot of hard work and attention that needs to be paid to the mechanisms by which we can improve test scores. So discussions about textbooks and the quality of textbooks, discussion about curricula, discussions about teacher education and the supply of teachers, discussions about the quality of assessment systems. These are the things that are going to improve quality and ultimately, we hope, improve test scores. But this obsession with test scores um, that, 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 that we see time and time again, I think is... Is, is not always very helpful. And, uh, yeah, I'll leave it like that. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Um, so, um, Angela's point about, I think it's very important points, that with public policy, we can target the poor with, um, with you know, pro-poor growth. Uh, we can try to do that, but I don't think, realistically, um, it seems unlikely that, and as, as much as I personally would like to have it, that having targets on inequality reduction will be something that, it, not, not to mention David Cameron's government would support, but I think probably the majority of governments around the world, to be honest. So, so um, that's why I think it's much more um, realistic to target um, intermediate kind of determinants of poverty um, at least, and maybe there will be some um, inequality reduction that that kind of comes out from that. Um, on the like the question of, I, and this is the you know, and this is the the, the um, if if any uh, targeting should be for inequality, I would think it would be global inequality. But then we come to the same issue that that would be about rich countries being forced to do stuff, and it's the same issue with how disappointing the whole the total lack of any climate change agreement has meant that basically there's nothing that SDGs could you know, build momentum on and that's just very, very disappointing and bleak. Um, and I, I, <laughs> um, that really wasn't one of what, how I wanted to end it, <laughs> but, but we are about to have a drink. But, but 
But I would definitely say that if we're serious about these kind of targets, then we need to build a, a consensus around them in the way that they've done around the, the other targets. And we have targets for these other areas because there were big international conferences with agreement pledges. And I hope it's not too late for some of the ones that we're talking about here. Thank you, thank you, Thank you, Paul. I'm going to do three things in, in one minute. Um, one is, is to thank the panel. Uh, fantastic uh, group of experts. Um, I, part of the reason for bringing this together was to get the band together again, because I think there's more work to do, and I think you all agree on that. So I very much hope that, that you might see uh, this group and on all of you contributing to some more work on the MDGs or the SDGs or what will happen next. So thank you so much for your contribution. I'll just remain up here to give a 15-second version of my 15-minute summing up of the meeting. A great meeting. Thank you all for coming. It's fantastic to see such a diversity of our membership here. Uh, I saw this meeting as something about presentation to our members. Uh, it's, I've come away with something about inspiration to LIDC. And two things I just wanted to say. One, uh, what makes interdisciplinarity work? Uh, wonderful messages. Um, catalysis and facilitation. Respect. Uh, a willingness to challenge one's own methods and to listen to others. And freedom to roam. And that's given us a bit of a brief to try to maintain and grow. My other point was that, you know, it's really interesting. Um, we set up four objectives at the beginning of LADC about research, teaching, um, policy support, and, and capacity building. And we've really just focused on research. It was the easy thing to do. And we've heard, you know, why today. It's harder to look at teaching and collaboration between colleges, harder to look at policy and engaging NGOs and so on, and particularly hard to look at building partnerships and so I think those other three areas we now have a, a request from our membership and a mandate to, to get busy looking at those. We've done really good on building research between colleges. We've got a, a broader agenda now, and I think we've got that steer. Okay, my final bit is about what happens next. Um, a summary of presentations will be on the website. You know, our website has just about everything we've ever done, and you can go really deep on almost any workshop or meeting on that. So please um, take advantage of that, and take advantage of that as members of LIDC. If you're not members um, in the Bloomsbury Colleges, you have to join now, okay? Please do that. Um, staff, students, and alumni. Um, and for those of you I heard who weren't from Bloomsbury Colleges, we're working on it, okay? We'd like this to be really the London International Development Center, but that'll take a little while uh, because we've got a lot of colleges and a lot of politics, but we're working on it. Um, finally, I'd like to ask our team to stand up. Um, Anna, Anna Mary, who is particularly responsible for the organization of this conference, and Sam. Sam Mardell, our manager, and Kathy, I think, had to duck out. Is she here? Um, but you saw Kathy earlier. Um, are Atlanta and Zena here? They're outside. They're outside. Okay. Um, our interns who helped in the desk. Uh, the LIDC intern program has been fantastic. Many, many uh, students from your colleges have taken part. Uh, we'd like it to be even bigger. It's been wonderful, and, and the interns have been really wonderful helping us with that. Um, Brige is... Is Breeze is out there too, is she? Okay, so Breeze, our administrator. We're just five of us, you know, and a couple interns. Um, I'd like to, to really thank them all for, for uh, making this possible and thank you for coming. And now the final point is that there are drinks over in the London School of Hygiene. If you don't know where that is, you're not really a good Bloomsburyan. <laughs> so just follow the people um, and we'll welcome you over there in a little while for some drinks and nibbles and conversation. Thank you.